Thank you, folks, for the music. Take your Bible, if you would. Turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 2. Luke, chapter number 2. The title of the message this morning is The Christian's Christmas. The Christian's Christmas. Let's start by reading the Christmas story together. This is the first time that I've read it in a group this year. I always look forward to the first time when as a church we can read the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, start reading with just verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from, Nat- from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea and the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The title of the message this morning is The Christian's Christmas. Let me begin by saying I love Christmas. There's not very much about Christmas that I don't like. I like the spirit that seems to come upon people during the Christmas time. It's a spirit of friendliness, a fellowship. Uh, I love family get-togethers. I like it when friends get together. I especially like it when as a church we get together. That's that spirit of Christmas that's just so exciting. I love the decorations. I love the Christmas tree. Now, in our home, we have a little bit of a problem. Uh, Andrea thinks we live in the White House. She thinks... Any tree that a president would have sitting in the White House, we ought to have sitting in our living room. But I always have to pull her back in and let her know we don't quite have that tall of a building. However, when it gets fully decorated, our 20-foot free, 24-foot tree looks pretty good and probably looks as good as the one in the White House. But I love the Christmas lights. I think the LEDs are just beautiful. They're so bright, so fast. I love the gifts. I like receiving the gifts, but I like giving the gifts. I like to watch my wife, who gets so excited about buying and shipping and giving gifts. She can write out a check for $10 and give it to a niece or a nephew that she's never even met, and it just lights up her whole day. I love everything there is about Christmas. But at the same time, I have to say, that is not the Christian's Christmas. The Christian's Christmas is not in the fellowships, it's not in the food, it's not in the friends, and it's not in the family. It's not in the trees, it's not in the gifts. Although I know, I know sometimes when we're giving the gifts, we like to picture them as a small picture of what Christ has given to us. And that's fine, that's great, but still those gifts don't begin to capture the gift that has been given to us. The lights, as bright, as festive as they are, all the glory that's adorned with our celebration of Christmas, it's good, it's wonderful, I'm not anti-Christmas at all. However, that's not the Christian's Christmas. You say, preacher, what is the Christian's Christmas? It's about the birth of Jesus. You know, it's kind of amazing for all the celebrating of Christmas that we do in our world today, there's very little celebration of the birth of Jesus. 
As a matter of fact, I would challenge you. We're really just at the beginning of the Christmas season now. Why don't you look and see how many times you can find anything about Christ in the Christmas that's being celebrated? When you watch the commercials that are on the television, how many times do they mention Jesus? How many times do they talk about the birth of the Savior into this world? When you go out and you shop with all the decorations that they have, with all the signs and the marquees and the advertisements, how many times do you see any reference at all to Jesus? As a matter of fact, it's sad, but it's true. Jesus has pretty much been sterilized out of Christmas. In many cases, they won't even use the word Christ because it makes reference to Jesus. And all aspects of the celebration of Christmas that goes on in the world around us today. It's not a Christian's Christmas. What is the Christian's Christmas? It all centers on the story that we just read. It centers on the birth of Jesus Christ. This morning, let's talk about a Christian's Christmas. Let me give you three thoughts of what a Christian's Christmas really is. Number one, a Christian's Christmas is a look at the plight of man. Now, you might think when I start to say that, that that's not going to be a very merry topic. And I'm afraid you're absolutely correct. We're really not getting into the merry parts of Christmas yet because we have to understand before we can enjoy the celebration of Christmas why a birth of Christ was necessary. I'd like to, if I had the time, to take you back to the book of Genesis, chapter number 3, so that you could see the cause of man's current plight. But I'm not going to do that strictly for the sake of time. But I do want to remind you that when God created this world, He didn't create it anything like it is today. It was a perfect world. The couple that He put into the Garden of Eden was a perfect couple. They had perfect bodies. They had a perfect union. They were living in a perfect place. But God gave to Adam and to Eve a choice. And He gave to them a command. The choice came in the form of a tree. He planted in the midst of the Garden of Eden a tree. The Bible calls it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we could just kind of shorten it. We could say it's the tree of death. Because anybody who partook of that tree was going to die. But He gave them this tree... And it was their choice. With that tree, he gave to them a command. The command is, don't eat of that tree. Don't even touch that tree. Do you realize they had so many trees they could have eaten from? I mean, there was a whole garden there. I don't know how many miles of acreage there was in the Garden of Eden, but it was probably filled with hundreds, thousands, maybe millions, maybe billions of trees. And they could eat of any one of the multitude of trees that were available. There was just one tree that God commanded. That's the one tree you cannot eat thereof. It's a choice. You can choose to do it, but in the day that you do it, you shall surely die. And you know, there were so many things that Adam and Eve could have done. They could have just obeyed God. They could have chosen not to eat that tree, not to even go near that tree. Maybe maybe there was a temptation. You know, human nature, especially now, when you're told not to do something, you want to do something. Well, they they could have built a wall up around that tree. Uh, They could have put a fence up around that tree. So if the temptation was there, they still wouldn't have been able to get to it. And if that wasn't enough, they could have moved. I mean, they had the whole planet. It's not like they had to stay right where that tree was. They could have gone to the other side of the garden. They could have gone to the other side of the world. There were so many choices they had. But you know the choice that they made. The choice that they made was to disobey God's command. And when they did that, they set the human race onto a plight. A plight of destruction. A plight of damnation. A plight of heartache, of heartbreak of pain and of suffering. That's the cause of man's plight. But I also want you to see the condition of man's plight. I'm not sure that we really understand just how bad things are. If you would take your Bible, go to the book of Ephesians chapter number 2. In Ephesians chapter number 2, Paul is writing and he describes the condition of the world and of us in this world as we're on this plight of destruction. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to start reading at verse number 1. 
Paul writes, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversations in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. I want you to notice he's describing what kind of condition we are in. The human race is in this bad situation. He describes it in verse number one. He says, you had he quickened. The word quickened means to be made alive. Now, before you can be made alive, something has to happen to you first. You've got to die. You can't be made alive if you haven't already died. So he's describing the condition of the human race. What's our condition? We're dead. What killed us? He tells us in verse number one, we're dead in trespasses and in sins. You know, most folks don't understand just how bad sin is. It's bad enough it's killed you. It's not just going to kill you. Sin has already killed you. It's killed your relationship with God. Right now, in our present state, without, without Christ, we can't have a relationship with God. We can't hear Him when He speaks. As a matter of fact, it's so bad that there's a large portion of people in our world today who don't even believe there is a God. That's not because there isn't a God. That's not even because that God doesn't speak. It's because they're so dead they can't hear that God speak. But not only does it kill the relationship that we have with God, it also kills our soul. You realize we're dead. What does that mean? It means not only can we not hear God, but we don't even desire to hear God. We don't want the things of God. That's, that's the mark of a soul that has been killed by sin and by the trespasses of sin. But it gets worse. You'll be dead in all eternity if something isn't done to fix your condition. You're dead now. You're dead in your relationship with God. Your soul is dead. But if you die, physically die, separated from God, you will forever be separated from God. You'll be dead for all eternity. Now, I'll be honest. People really don't like for you to preach that type of stuff, especially not at Christmas. We brought you here under the allure that we're going to ring bells. It's Merry Christmas. And now you're standing up there and you're preaching to me and you're telling me I'm on this sinful plight and that I have already died because of my sins and my trespasses. And it gets even worse because that Bible verse goes on to describe how now we're following after the world and we're following after Satan and how ultimately we just do what we want to do and not what God wants us to do. And maybe you're thinking, preacher, you lured me here under false pretenses. But you see, before you can appreciate the message of a Merry Christmas, you have to understand the condition you are in. You have to understand the plight of mankind. What's the Christmas story? What is the Christian's Christmas? It's the understanding of man's plight. But number two, it's the knowledge of God's promise. God made man a promise. As a matter of fact, here's the amazing thing. We didn't read Genesis chapter number three, just refer to it, but the same day, the very same day that Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit. The very same day that they put the human race into this downward spiral of sin and death. On that same day, God made man a promise. Now the promise that he made is so veiled that you could have read it and not really understood what it meant. But it's a promise. It's not an elaborate promise. It's not a big promise. It's not a tremendous promise. It's just a small promise. As a matter of fact, uh, I like to refer to it as a stick man promise. I don't know if you can draw or not. I can't draw. If I'm going to draw anything, I have to draw a stick man. And, and really, that doesn't give you any detail. It doesn't give you any awareness. It just indicates there's something there. Well, God made a promise it's back in Genesis chapter number three. It's small. You might read it and not understand it, but it's there. And it's a powerful, powerful promise. Let me read it to you. It's Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. Listen to what God promised. He's speaking to the devil. And in verse 15, he says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, 
but thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, I'm going to read it to you again because you probably didn't understand it. It says this. This is God's promise. The day that Adam and Eve sinned, God looked at the devil and he said this. I will put enmity between you, talking to the devil, and the woman. And between your seed, the devil's seed, and her seed. And it, this enmity, shall bruise your head, devil, and it will bruise his heel. What in the world does that mean? Man, that's, that's a promise, but what does it mean? Most folks don't even know what enmity means. <laughs> I could just about wager. It, unless you're a preacher or a Sunday school teacher, you probably never use the word enmity in a sentence. You probably never will use it. Let me tell you what it means. You could just about pull the word enmity out of that verse and drop in the two words, an enemy. An enemy. This is what God's saying. He's looking at the devil. He says, I'm going to put an enemy between you, devil, and this woman. Between that woman's seed in your seat. And that enemy is going to bruise your head, devil. His heel will get bruised, but your head is going to get bruised. Now that is such a veiled promise that you probably don't even understand what he's talking about. He's going to send an enemy, but he doesn't tell us enough of the details for us to know who that enemy is. He doesn't, he doesn't give us enough of the details for us to recognize when he comes, but he makes a promise. God makes a promise. You say, well, preacher, why are you elaborating on that so much? Because the Bible goes on to add to that promise. The Bible is a big book. It's got 66 books in it. Those 66 books contain 1,189 different chapters. Together, they have 33,102 Bible verses in our Bible. And that big, big book has many more promises about this person that is supposed to come. Each one of those promises is like a paint stroke on that stick figure. You start with just a little skeleton, but the more you read through the Bible, the more you see that God is describing that person and he describes him with prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. I, I wrote down some of the prophecies. I, I, I don't just want to read them to you. That probably wouldn't be very exciting to you. But let me just give you a few of the references of these prophecies. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, he said that enemy would be born to a virgin. In the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse number 2, he said that enemy, the devil's enemy, would be born in Bethlehem. In Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse number 15, he said that enemy would be like Moses. Moses was rejected first, and then he was accepted later on. In the book of Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 3, he said of that enemy, he would be despised. In the book of Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9, he told us of that enemy that he would come into Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey. In the book of Psalm chapter 41, verse number 9, he said of that enemy, he would be betrayed by a friend. In Zechariah chapter 11, verse number 12, he said of that enemy, he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. In the book of Isaiah 53, verse number 8, he said that enemy would be arrested, be put into prison. In Psalm chapter 35, verse number 11, he said false witnesses would tell lies about that enemy. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, he told us that that enemy's back would be beaten, his beard would be plucked, and his face would be spit upon. In the book of Psalm chapter 22, verse number 7, he said of that enemy that people would mock him. In Psalm 22, verse number 8, he told us what the people would say that were killing that enemy. He, he actually gave us their words. This is what they would say according to Psalm 22, verse 8. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. In Psalm 22, verse 16, that enemy was told that his hands and his feet would be pierced. In Isaiah 53, verse number 12, he told us that that enemy would be counted among the sinners. And in Isaiah 53, verse number 8, he told us that that enemy would be killed, not for his crimes, but for ours. Now, wait a minute. Each one of those prophecies is like an artist takes a paintbrush and he adds a little bit more of a stroke to that first promise that he gave us. He just told us in that first promise he was going to put an enemy between the devil and us. Not our enemy, the devil's enemy. That that enemy would get his foot hurt, but he was going to step, stomp on the head of the devil. And then for the rest of the Old Testament, he added stroke after stroke, promise after promise, making the details of that person who was to come so clear. 
But if you have any knowledge of the Bible at all and have any type of an open heart, you would have to recognize that the one that he promised is God's Son, Jesus Christ. What is the Christian's Christmas? Well, it's understanding man's plight. Hey, we're doomed. We're damned. We don't like to talk about that, but we are. But it's also understanding God's promise. He has promised someone would come. Someone would come that would help us. The third part of the Christmas story is it's understanding the price that was paid. Now maybe you're thinking to yourself, there you go, preacher. I don't come to your church but once or twice a year and every time I come you start talking about the cross. You're kind of right. <laughs> You see, the story of Christmas, it's kind of like a good joke. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense until you get to the end. And the story of what Jesus Christ has done really doesn't make a lot of sense until you get to the end. You see, you've got to know more than the plight of man. You've got to know more than that God is going to send somebody to help man in that plight. You've got to know more than just that that one that he has sent is Jesus Christ. You've even got to know more than the fact that he died for you. You have to know who he is, what he has done, and you have to put your faith and trust in what Jesus Christ has done for you. And when we're talking about Christmas, we're not just talking about the birth of a baby. We're talking about the death of the Savior. That Jesus Christ, God's Son, God's Son was born into this world. That He grew up a sinless life. That somewhere around the age of 33 and a half years of age, He allowed sinful men to take Him, strip Him, beat Him, plant a crown of thorns upon His head, drive Him up to the top of a hill, and then nail Him to a cross where for hours he agonized and died a slow and painful death. And that he did that for us. It's the payment for our sins. Now, maybe you're thinking, preacher, you just over-dramatize. You can't see the cross from the cradle. I would say you can This past spring, Joseph and I built a project. Joseph built the project and I watched him. He built a shed for us. And then we built a door. We built the door out of two by four, so it was a heavy door. Then we put wooden planks over there, so it was a very heavy door. And it was a very wide door. It's wide enough to drive a lawnmower through. Ride a lawnmower, ride a lawnmower through. And so when I was hanging that door, I thought to myself, I'm just not sure two hinges are going to get this door up here and hold it. So I got three. I got three of the biggest hinges that I could find. And that door rests and it revolves on those three hinges. I don't know if you understand or not, but there's three hinges that the whole history of mankind rests upon and revolves on. The birth of Jesus Christ the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All the history of mankind rests and revolves on those three hinges. It's interesting. You can see that shed from a distance. We painted it now. But the things we didn't paint were the hinges. And you can be 50 foot away and you can see those hinges glistening in the sun. You can be looking at the beauty of the door. You might admire the, the, the paint job. It might all look shiny and good. But no matter where you are, you can see those three hinges. Let me tell you, not only from the cradle can you see the cross, but from every point in a human being's life, you see the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? Because man's on a plight. I don't want to use the word journey because that's not an accurate description. This isn't a journey that we're on. This is a plight that we're in. We're headed for eternal separation from
from God. But God made a promise. That promise began to be fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And it's recorded for us in the book of Luke, chapter number 2. And it's not got anything to do with trees or mistletoe or lights or human gifts or movies or music. It's got to do with God. With God putting on flesh and coming into this world. Knowing when He came that He was coming to die for your sins and for my sins. Somebody said, the world's about choices. Life's about choices, and that's true. Life is about choices. Back in the garden, God gave a tree and He gave a command. He's given another tree, and He's given now another command. The tree that He gave the second time wasn't in a garden. It was on a hillside. It was on Mount Calvary. This tree wasn't a growing tree. It was a dead tree. It was carved into a cross. But whereas that first tree in the garden spoke of death, that second tree on the hill of Calvary speaks of life. Like He gave a command in the garden, don't touch that tree. He gives a command concerning this cross on Calvary. He says, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The command is come. Adam and Eve partook of the first tree and they died. If you, if you will come to the second tree, you can be made alive. That's what the story of the Christian Christmas is. You're not going to find it on the Hallmark Channel. I'm not against the Hallmark Channel. You're not going to find it in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Frosty the Snowman, in the malls or at Walmart. The only place you're going to find the true story of Christmas is at the foot of the cross. For there, a babe lies in a manger and He's waiting for you to receive Him as the Savior of the world. Would you bow your heads, please? Close your eyes. Father, I pray that You would speak to hearts this morning, especially those who may not know who You are. Lord, in the world that we live in, people are taught so many different things. There may well be an atheist here among us. There may be somebody who worships a different God here. And we're grateful if they're here. We're grateful. But God, what we pray is that You would open eyes and open hearts. Not through any word that I could say. The sweet Spirit of God, that You would open eyes and hearts by Your presence, by Your person. May the soul that's closest to hell today Find the joy, forgiveness, and redemption. We're going to give you the praise for what you do, for we ask it in Jesus' name.